Welcome to Herzog College in Israel. This past week, more than 5,000 people from all over the world gathered here in Alon Shavut for our annual Yemei Yun B'Tanach. Herzog College is a world leader in Jewish education and teacher training with more than 3,500 students studying on our four campuses. Herzog graduates impact tens of thousands of school children each year in Israel and abroad. On behalf of everyone at Herzog College, I hope you'll enjoy this shiur, and I invite you to join us here in person next year. Okay, friends, each year we sit on the floor on Tisha B'Av and we read the Gibat and really struggle if we've ever tried to really get a sense of what's going on. Where does this begin? Is there a middle? Is there an end to the Megillah as a whole? Any one of its prakim? Is there a flow? Why are things expressed in this order? And this is a big mystery. It's a big mystery. If it's a big mystery for you, I'll tell you that it's been a big mystery for many, many people that have looked at Megillah Pichah. Sometimes we assume, this is how Chazal told us, that we can look at Megillah Pichah, that these are, in the, in the language of Chazal, keynote, in English, lamentations. Maybe just a spontaneous outpouring of grief, of loss, of sorrow, of misery, that perhaps is one way to do it, but that doesn't explain, doesn't help us explain the order of things. It also seems to me that to say that what we have here is kind of just a spontaneous I, because it uh, doesn't really seem to fit, you know, as we all well know, since today we're looking at just the first parak, parak Aleph is an acrostic, it follows the alphabet. Nobody in spontaneous sorrow goes, uh, A, awful, B, bad, very bad, you know, Gimel, Givald. This is not the way, this is not the way in which people spontaneously release whatever deep, deep loss and sorrow that they're feeling. And so I want to try to, to present today a different way of understanding Echa with a focus on Karakala. In the wake of the Chorban, we know that the Navi Yechezkel is there to minister to the Jews that went to Babel. But the Jews that remained in Yerushalayim following the Chorban, who certainly must have had enormous and difficult theological questions, because the situation with which they were presented was unprecedented. Because for the first time in the history of Am Yisrael, there's no Beit Mikdash since it was built. For the first time in the history of Am Yisrael, there's no Melech in Yerushalayim. For the first time in the history of Am Yisrael, 90 plus percent of its inhabitants have been shipped out to Babel. Never in the history of Am Yisrael has been this degree of slaughter and of suffering on such a wide scale. All of these are big, massive, heavy questions. If you will, perhaps some of like the questions that maybe some asked following the Shoah. Except so there's one difference between the reality post Shoah and the reality for Am Yisrael living in Yerushalayim post Chorban. That is, that in our time, in spite of these big, big questions, just a few years later, we got Medina Yisrael, and I think that that allowed our national collective uh, attention to be turned to happier things that are easier to think about, look to the future rather than to the past. But if you're living in Yerushalayim following the Chorban, the year passes, 10 years pass, 20 years pass, and not much has changed. And so the questions are enormous. And I want to read this this afternoon, the first parak of Megillat Echa as an attempt to deal with these big questions. And I want to explain a little bit some of the assumptions I have about how we're going to see that this parrot goes about doing this. There, are, what we're going to see this afternoon is that this parrot can be split into two voices, two characters that are talking to us, really exactly like you would find in a, a play by Shakespeare, you know, parts that you can easily parcel out. Now, who, what are these parts? They're very easy to identify. When we have someone who speaks about Yerushalayim in the third person, such as the first puzzle, Echa Yashva Vada, alas, how lonely she sits. That is our first character. That is going to be Yirmiyahu. Okay? I'm going to call that character Yirmiyahu. When we have someone speaking about Yerushalayim in the first person, 
For example, on the second page of the handout, uh, if you look at uh, 16C towards the bottom, uh, or 16A, al ele ani I, me, first person, phrases like that are going, we're going to assume that that is not Yirmiyahu speaking. That is the figure that we're going to call Batsion. This is a, a, a representation uh, uh, and, uh, of, of, of Yerushalayim as a whole at that time. And what we're going to see is that Yerushalayim and Batsion are having a conversation. Now, to help us know where we're at in the conversation, what I've done, since we all have Tanakhim, I nonetheless recreated the, uh, the text here for two reasons. The text of Eifa is difficult, and so everyone here will have the English <coughs> on the left-hand side. I'm going to read the Tzuki in the Hebrew, and anyone that wants, that isn't clear about a certain word, has the linear translation on the left. But also, what I've done here with the, with the translation is that I have put... The, uh, the, 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 the voice that I'm calling Yirmiyahu, third person, is in block text, regular text. So you'll see Pasuk Aleph is just regular block text. If you look at the other thing that we looked at, 16a, so you see that that's in italics, okay? That's because it's in first person. And so anytime we see a Pasuk in block letters, that's third person, that's Yirmiyahu speaking. Anytime that we see uh, someone speaking in first person about me, what I'm experiencing, my people, my daughters, etc. This is Batsion, and you'll be able to know that simply by the fact that it is in italics. Now, I want to say a few more things about uh, these, these two people, these two characters that we're going to be encountering. The first, Hear Me Out, the narrator. The narrator here, Yermiao, is different than the narrator that we encounter in the rest of Tanakh. By which I mean the following. When we read a passage like Bereshit bara Elohim Shamayim that is a narrator speaking. That's not HaKadosh Baruch Hu speaking in the passage. Otherwise it would be Bereshit Barati Eta Shamayim Eta'aretz. So throughout Tanakh, we have this kind of third-person narrator who tells us what's going on, even all the way at the beginning of Rishi, and we never really think much about who is this narrator. It's Kiv Yachol, as it were. It's a kind of a heavenly scribe who sits up there next to the Kisei HaKavod, next to the Rebbe Sholem. This uh, narrator seems to know everything that a Kodesh Baruch Hu knows, and so we don't really think about the narrator in most parts of Tanakh as a personality, as living in a certain time, as having any feelings He's just representing the Kodesh Baruch Hu's view on things. That's not the case here. When we read the, the phrases that are said in the third person, this is not the narrator that we see everywhere else. This is Yirmiyahu. This is someone who on the one hand represents a Kodesh Baruch Hu's view on things, but at the same time loves his people. And at the same time is also suffering together with his people. And Yirmiyahu's aim in this parak is to engage Batsion and to help her deal with all of these massive theological issues that have been brought about by the Chorban, the things that I mentioned before. No Besamekdash, no king, uh, Galut, unimaginable suffering, and the distance that she feels, and the anger that she feels. And what we're going to see is that Yirmiyahu is going to engage in a process, friends, of therapy with Batsion, therapy. Just like you would go to a counselor, to a rabbi, there's a safe space created, perhaps, to say things that you normally wouldn't say. The person listening to you, a counselor, a rabbi, is someone who understands your pain deeply, but knows that there's a process that you have to go through. And Yirmiyahu, on the one hand, is going to be trying to get Batsion to understand certain things that she needs to understand that perhaps are difficult for her, but at the same time is going to do so in a very sympathetic way. Because as we all know, if you see someone and they're really in deep, they have deep, deep issues, deep problems, and you can see clearly what they need to do, they don't see it at all. To go over to someone and say, you know, you have issues you've got to be working on. The, your, 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 your view of what's going on in your business is totally blinded. Your view of what's happening in your relationship with so-and-so is, is totally blinded. Uh, you're, you're caught up in a certain cycle. 
It's very difficult to tell people these things. Very difficult. The only way in which a person can successfully convey to someone else, you need to rethink things, is if that person, here in Yemiyahu, approaches the other person in a sense of total sympathy. I'm not coming here to criticize you. I'm not coming here to put you down. I'm coming here because I love you. And I'm going to demonstrate that. The more credit that the mochia has, the more credit the person who wants to impart a lesson has with the person who needs to learn the lesson, the more that the, that the person who needs to learn the lesson feels that they are embraced by the person speaking to them, the more open they will be to hearing the difficult things that they need to hear. This is Yirmiyahu. The other thing about Zion, I want to say one thing about it. Totally shell-shocked, totally blown away. The Bat Sion that we're going to see here in this parrot is not exactly one for one the actual feelings and representation of people who are still living in Yerushalayim. There's a slight difference, and I want to use the following image to explain how we need to understand the Bat Sion that we encounter here in Eicha Perikah. Put aside Eicha, put aside Tanakh. Imagine, friends, if you will, um, in an elementary school setting. Kids are gathered in a class, and they're given a video presentation about road safety. Right? I mean, this happens, right? We call them here, Shirei Zahav, Zihirut Badrachim. Okay? And let's say that there's a little movie being projected on the screen for the youngsters sitting in the room, and in the screen is a little boy with a ball. And he has his ball, and the ball rolls into the street. And in the movie, the little boy runs to the edge, oh, and he comes to a screeching halt at the sidewalk. And he goes, oh, my ball has rolled into the street. But the street is dangerous. Oh, I should look right, and I should look left. And if I don't see anything, then maybe, maybe I can go and get my ball. Now, that little boy is supposed to be like the little kids who are watching the film, but there's just one difference. The kids, the real kids, don't stop. They run after the ball. And the reason we have videos like this is to create a model for the youngsters to, to look at, to say, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be. The batsiyon that we are going to encounter in Eicha Perak Aleph is like the kid in the video. We are going to see that she moves through seven stages of spiritual development, starting from the lowest rung. And what the author of Eicha, what Yermiyahu is trying to do is to say, Am Yisrael, Bat Zion, those who are still living in Yerushalayim, what you need to do is there are going to be seven stages of spiritual awakening that you need to get through in order to reach your, your full spiritual maturation and understanding of what has just happened here in Yerushalayim. And so each of those initial stages, stages one through six, before we get to seven, or as we're going to see, each of them is still somewhat imperfect because this is the nature of growth. This is the nature of therapy. It only moves step by step. You cannot get to the last step before all the previous steps, which by definition are in one form or another lacking. Okay? Good. One more thing before we begin. <coughs> the dominant image in this parak is of a woman. Of a woman looking for manly support. And it borrows from an image that we have throughout the Tanakh. That Am Yisrael is like a wife to the Rabbonu Shlolam, her husband. And in that paradigm of wife and husband, the wife is meant to be loyal and supportive. And in return, the man provides sustenance and guardianship and protection over the woman. This is the biblical way in which they thought about marriage. And this is the paradigm for Am Yisrael and the Kodesh Baruch. When a woman is no longer faithful, then the man withdraws his support. When the man withdraws his support, then a woman seeks other forms, other men, to give her guardianship, to give her protection and sustenance. And this happened historically, that when Am Yisrael, the wife, wasn't faithful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu withdraws his protection, and Am Yisrael looks for other men 
This is especially evident in Yechezkel, Perak, Ted Zion. Those other men being strong nations that were around to give her protection. Kind of selling herself on the cheap. Maybe I can make a treaty with you. Maybe you'll give me protection in the hopes that that would work. And it never worked. It never worked and it never worked. And it ends, it ends in the floor. And we want to see that this image uh, is going to be ever present in this parak. Who is going to give this poor woman, Batsyon, the protection that she is looking for? Final word. We are now prepared to start reading Eicha Paragon. I said that what we're going to see here is a dialogue between Yirmiyahu as rabbi, counselor, therapist, okay? Batsyon as someone really struggling with a lot of issues. The dialogue part only begins, you can see, the whole first page, as you can see, is all block letters. That means that it's all third person. That means that it's all just hear me out speaking. Until we get to uh, the middle of the second page, or the top of the second page, when we get to Pasuk Tet, or what I've labeled here as 9C. Phrase 9C is the first time that we have uh, the... Uh, yeah, talents, and that's the first time that Batsion will speak. Okay? Just a little bit about this, what might be unusual for many of us, separating out Sukkim in this way, 1A, 1B, 1C. As we all know, Echa <coughs> is poetry, and most of the Sukkim have two or three, sometimes more, uh, stitches, strophes, that's the technical part. And each one is going to be very important for us. And so, and so in order to help us say, not the beginning of Pasuket, the end of Pasuket, I'll be able to say, we're looking now at 1A, 1B, 1C. Okay? As I said, the first, almost the first full nine Sukkim is said only by Yirmiyahu. And now we're going to start to read these nine Sukkim. And what we're going to see is that Yirmiyahu is trying to do here two things. Two things. Number one. Yirmiyahu needs to establish his bona fides that he is here with Batsyon. I embrace you. I understand you. I know your pain. I can describe your reality externally and internally even better than you can. <laughs> and then when Batsyon hopefully feels that Yirmiyahu is with her, that will open a space for him to also suggest that there are things that need to be repaired. The other thing that, that, that Yirmiyahu is going to do in these nine Sukim is he's going to make a series of uh, propositions about what has happened, interpretations of what has happened, that maybe to us might seem simple, but as we will see, the propositions that he makes are ones that with which Batsyon <laughs> and the rest of the chapter is going to be grappling with, accepting partially, rejecting partially. Okay? So let's start now... The, the parak. We're going to read now through the first, almost fully through the first nine suki, seeing how Yirmiyahu, pastor, rabbi, counselor, uh, expresses his, his, uh, his, his sympathy and understanding of a predicament and makes several prepositions. So, starting with Pasuk Aleph, Eicha Yashvavadad, Ha'ir Rabati Am Ha'ita Ke'amana. When he says haita ke almana, what is an almana? An almana is a woman whose husband is dying. Well, this is exactly how Batsion views herself. She is a woman whose husband, i.e. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, isn't here. Maybe even for many people residing in Yerushalayim, there's a thought, maybe God doesn't exist. Maybe he's been defeated and killed. Something like that. It's not a crazy idea. And so Yirmiyahu already mouths the words that she is thinking. He is describing her reality as she experiences it. Haitake Amana. She thinks that she has no husband. Rabati Bagoyi. Sarati Bandinot. Haitalamas. She's thinking, wow, I had it so good. And now I you know I went from being so high up to now being so low down. Bacho ti pasubet bacho tivke balaira vidimata alechia en la menache mikol oavea. When Yirmiyahu says she has no comforter from all of her friends, this isn't just stop, no one's coming to pay a shiver call. This is a reference politically, historically, to what happened. She had sought other ohaveha. Ohaveha, it's not just friends, as I've translated it here. Ohaveha is her lovers, all those men, those protective nations that she sought out 
after she began to engage in the Bodhisattva at the beginning of Bayat Rishon. And so she sought out these other nations. She thought they would be there for her. None of her lovers managed to work out for her. To see all of those lovers wound up turning on her. They got her on the cheap and they chewed her up and they spit her out. There's a nice play here between Ohev, Ohaveha, her lovers, who switch just a switch of a almost a part of a letter. Go from being Ohev to Oyev. We became her Oyev. These are all the things that Bat Zion would say about herself. I can't believe this. <coughs> I had trusted this God and now he's dead. I thought I would have all of these uh, support from all of these other men, as it were, these other powerful nations, and they all turned on me. You can see, verse 4 has more stitches to it. It's almost to a crescendo. He is giving, he is giving an outline of her misery. Notice, four full psukim in Yumiyao has not said a single word of criticism. Because he wants to show Batsion that he's with her, that he understands her, that he can verbalize and vocalize her pain, maybe even better than she can. That he understands all the different facets of her circumstance. That is designed to win over her confidence that he really does support her. Pasuk, hey. Hayud Sareha Lerosh, Oiveha. Shalu ki Hashem hogah al rov pshaeha. This is the first time that he mentions any any uh, 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 fault on the part of Baxion. And here we have the first proposition. To us, it might seem simple. We'll see later on what Baxion does what <laughs> does with it. What has happened to her? All of this misery is because Hashem has caused her yagom uh, difficulty, groaning. Pain. Hashem has deliberately caused her this pain. Having mentioned a little bit about her Averot, he goes back now to again. Uh, sympathetically describing her pain and anguish so that she won't feel that he has suddenly turned on her, but that he's with her. Again, for the first time, the second time, introducing that some of this is her fault. Let's turn the page. And now, 9C. We come to the for, for the first time and we hear Batsia. 9C. Her opening phrase. It's the most important phrase in the entire parrot to get this right. She says, Re'e Hashem et on ye ki higdil oyev. I want us to pick this very seemingly simple puzzle apart. She says, Re'e Hashem. Et on ye ki hidil oyev. As I said, I view the things that Batsion is saying and will be saying as that kind of video with the little boy who models behavior for the little children who are watching the video. This is the first step that Yirmiyahu wants Batsion to get to. Let's analyze what she is saying in this seemingly deceptively simple puzzle. 
And we will see there are things that she gets right, but there are things that are not quite right in a statement like this. So let's pick it apart. What's right is that she calls out to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, Re'eh Hashem. And the implicit statement here is that this dialogue between Bat Sion and Yemiyahu, to be read, to be read to the actual inhabitants of Yerushalayim, is to tell them your first step is to recognize there's an address. You should call out. Re'e Hashem, that seems good. Edoni, by suffering. Ki hikdil oyev. Together with what's good for calling out to Hashem, there are at least two things that are somewhat problematic with this. The first, when she says, Re'e Hashem edoni, Rebona Shalom, look at my suffering. This implies that she believes that he's not seeing her suffering. That he's somewhere else. But the reality, of course, is that he's right there. He's on top of every move. He's, in fact, behind every move. He is responsible for every move. Everything that's happened is because he's been orchestrating everything. But in this first statement that Dachbat Sion makes, she doesn't quite get that. So what's good is that she's prepared to call to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and yet it's lacking in that she seems to understand or misunderstand that Hashem isn't present, that Hashem doesn't know what's going on, but he really does. The second thing that perhaps is not quite accurate is when she says, Hey, Rebano Shalom, Re'eton Yi, Hikdi Eloyev, though the enemy is so strong, as if to say, why was there a Chorban? There was a Chorban because Hikdi Eloyev, because the other army is so strong. But that's not why, that's not why she's suffering. Re'ei Hashem Eton Yi, her suffering is ultimately, of course, because of her own misdoing. But she doesn't see that. And this is why this statement, 9c, the end of Pasuk Tet, is only a very first stop in Bat Sion's spiritual rehabilitation. This is the very minimum that, that, that Yermiel wants the residents of Yerushalayim to get to. If you guys can have it within you to turn to a Kaddish Baruch Hu and call to him and get everything else wrong, that's a good first step. And that's what Bat Sion does. Let's read on. 10a. And you see here, it's in block letters. Okay, That means that this is now Yirmiyahu speaking. This, this voice is going to speak about Yerushalayim in the third person. Yirmiyahu says, Yado paras tsar al kol machamadeha. Kira atagoyim bao mikdasha. Notice, Yirmiyahu here and never again. Throughout the rest of the parak, Yirmiyahu will never say another critical word about Bat Sion. She's on a roll. She has recognized that the Kaddish Baruch Hu is the right address. And so what Yirmiyahu, as counselor, as therapist, wants to do is to urge her on, to show how much he's with her. She said in 9c, Higdil Oyev, Yirmiyahu says, oh yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's so true. Here, let me flesh that out. I'll, I'll, I'll say to you, Batsion, you said he did, oh yeah, I'll tell you exactly what he did. Yado paras tsar, akoma hamadeha, kira tago yim bao mikdasha. And she's there going, oh, this guy gets me. Yeah, this this this, this is the detail of ki he did, oh yeah. I, I relate to this guy. He he gets me. I shared sivita, 10c. Here, Yemiel, Actually addresses a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Asher Tzivita, you commanded. Lo yavau lach. Look what the impact is for Bat Sion here. Yirmiyahu, the representative of Kaddish Baruch Hu, turns to the Rebbe Shalom and says, Asher Tzivita, you commanded that goyim, tmeim, like this. Lo yavau, the kahal lach. You said that such goyim are unmanageable material for us, and now that there's parade, trapes and parade through the base of Mikdash? How, how could it be? But you command that we're not even allowed to marry them, and now they can just parade into the Beis Mikdash, into the Kodesh Kadashi at will. The impact of that is enormous. Because what she sees is that Yirmiyahu is questioning the Kodesh Baruch Hu, even as she questions the Kodesh Baruch Hu. And this, I think, brings her along. And this is what we see. Pasuk Yudal. Yirmiyahu continues. His description, his detail, of what Bat Sion had said at the end of 9c, Hikdiloyev. What does it mean, Hikdiloyev? 
continues, hear me out. Pasuk Yud Aleph, Kol Aman Enachim, Mivakshim Lechem, Natnu Machamadehem Beochel, Rashiv Nafesh, 11C. We're back in italics. Batsion jumps in. She's been moved by what Yirmiyahu says, and she says, Re'e Hashem Vehabita, Ki Hayiti Zolela. Zolela? Abject, I become like a Ben Sora, like, like a, a Ben Sora, no, no, Zolel the Sobe. I, I dive at, at, at breadcrumbs. I pounce on them because I'm so hungry. Now, let's try to measure here what has happened in terms of Bat Sion's spiritual disposition on what's going on. She started, and we said, heart was good. She turned to Akash Baruch and Pasadet. That's a good start. She misunderstood that Hashem doesn't know what's going on. And she misunderstood that the tragedy that's befallen her is because she thought it was because the enemy was powerful. When in fact, it's just because of her other love. She doesn't know that. That was Pasuk Tech. Let's see what advance has happened now in her second statement, which is here in Pasuk Yudalef 11c. When she says, Re'e Hashem Vehabita Kihayiti Zolela. Well, we can clearly see that it's a little more emphatic now because she says, Re'e Hashem Vehabita. We see that there's a little bit of improvement because she no longer attributes what happened to her to foreign armies. But the biggest advance here is this. In Pasuk Tet, she called out to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, Re'e Hashem! And what was Hashem's response? No response. God didn't respond in the meantime. And so, by having Bat Sion call out again in Pasuk Yud Aleph, more emphatically, because Hashem was silent the first time, but Hashem, Ve'abita. This is spiritual advancement, because the lesson here is, for the residents of Yerushalayim, Yirmiyahu is saying, I want you to call out to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And when you don't get an answer from him, because you're not going to get an answer from him, do you know what you need to do? Call out again. And that's what she does. That's an advance. That's the next step of her maturation. The very fact that she calls out to a Kaddish Baruch Hu a second time after not having had any response from a Kaddish Baruch Hu from the first time. So that's 11C. <clears throat> Pasuk Yudbet. Bat Sion continues. Lo Aleichem Call of Rey Derek. Habitu Ureu, Imeshmach of Kemach Ovi, Asher Olali, Asher Hoga Hashem beyond Haron at What What is happening here? What is Batsion having turned now twice to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, having gotten no response? The author of this parak gives her license, as it were, to turn outwards. Is it nothing to you all who pass by? In other words, there is a license here for the residents of Yerushalayim to turn for our support elsewhere. There's a recognition that they will want to do that. There's a space to do that. There's permission given to turn to a source other than a Kaddish Baruch. And so Yerushalayim, Batsion turns here in Pasuk Yudal, Pasuk Yudbet, 12a. Lo alechem kol she is dying for, as we say in Hebrew, Tzumi. She wants attention. She wants people to pay attention to her pain. 12C, Asher Olal Li. Asher Hoga Hashem Yom Charon We come now to the next level of her spiritual maturation. What has happened here in 12C? What do you see for the first time? Oh, this isn't because Yigdil Oyev. I now recognize that this is happening because of what Hashem did to me. Asher Olali. Notice that first phrase, Asher, which he did to me. He, you know, it's like at home, you know, like, what, what did your brother do? He, he, you don't know, dare say his name. You're that angry at the other person. Asher Olali, which he did to me. And then only after that, 
Asher Hoga Hashem, the, the affliction that Hashem did, Beyom Charon Apo. Now we would think, gosh, if she recognizes this is all from Akash Baruch Hu, we're finished. She's there. This is the full maturation. No. no. Why not? What's missing? What's that? Her role. Her role. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. She says, okay, okay. I get it in 12C. Asher Hoga Hashem. It's from God. But why is it from God? Beyond Charon Apo? He flipped out? God flipped out? What is this? Destruction on this level? This is a wrathful God. That's what she's saying. But it's from God. So it's a step up. This is the third step, but it's not yet fully mature. She is angry at God because God is angry at her. Look now at all the things that she accuses HaKadosh Baruch Hu of. This is going to take us from 15a all the way to 15b. What, what were the manifestations of this God flipping out on me? With un unbridled anger, unjustified anger. 13a. Mi marom shalach esh v'atz motai v'yerdema. Paras reshet levablai heshivani achor. Netanani shomima kol hayom davak. Niskad ob sha'ai biado. Istargu alu al sabari. Hichshil kochi. Netanani Adonai de lo uchal kum. Sila kol adunai Adonai bekiubi. Kara alai moed bishbor bachurai. This is the longest speech that she gives. It is a litany of all the terrible things that Akash Baruch Hu did for her. Now, she does recognize that her sins were not. She said that in, in, in 12c, she recognized that it was from Hashem. In 14a, Niskad Ol Psha'ai Biado, not only is it from God, but I'm even ready to recognize that I have Psha'im here. But it's still not the full maturation. Why? Because she still thinks that God went overboard. Or, as my kids say, okay, how about a punishment, but not that punishment. It's too much. This is what she's doing. Now, this kind of jacques, this litany of claims that she makes against Hashem, look what the author of Eicha has done. He has created a safe space for her to vow, for her to spew her frustration, her vexation, her anger at a Kaddish Baruch Hu for what he has done. You know, in therapy, that's very important. You have to, in the therapy room, you can yell and scream and you can curse, you know, the dearest people in your life. They're walls. Because you go outside the walls. And it's, it's really important to do that. Only by getting it out can you then move on. And so it's very important for the author of Eicha to say, Yushalayim, you have tightness against the Rebbe Shalom, let them out! Or even better, here I'm going to show you a movie where I'm, I'm showing you that them out, and you have my signature on it, my askama on this text. This is what you will feel. That is a necessary step, and I accept that that's a necessary step. For us to be able to express anger against the Kaddish Baruch Hu is critical. It is a critical part of a relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Just like any human relationships we have. If we are really angry at somebody, we're told, you're not allowed to be angry at that person. You're not allowed to express your anger at that person. Well, that's just a recipe for eventual break. I once went to a conference of Bible scholars. And I was at a dinner. And there were two scholars sitting next to me. It's a long banquet table, one opposite the other. One of them says, the guy opposite of me says, I'll tell you something. I don't believe in God. And the guy opposite him says, me either. And the first one says, but I'll tell you something else. If I did believe in God, I'd be very angry with him. <laughs> and the other guy says, me too. <laughs> now, you know, I don't check anybody's sisters or anything, and I, I certainly believe that these two men, who I know personally, great scholars, probably had some very difficult times in their lives. But I learned from watching this conversation that if you block off the possibility of being angry at someone, even the Kaddish Baruch Hu, that's a recipe for someone just walking out the door totally. And so, in Eicha, there's plenty of room for Batsyon to be angry as a step in a process. And that's why this is only a step. Okay? So we got to step, I think I would call, 
12C was step number three, where she recognized for the first time that this all is from God. And 14A, when she says, <coughs> you kind of gathered all of my averot, all of my pshaim, to make a heavy yoke of punishment, to recognize that there are pshaim here, that perhaps is stage four. But she's still very angry. Okay? Good. We're up to 15C. And we're back to Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu has heard this list of about seven or eight things that Kodesh Baruch has done to her. And what's he going to do now? How is he going to get credit with her? He's going to jump in and say and accuse the Kodesh Baruch of something even worse. Even worse. Because if the Kodesh Baruch what did he do? If he rolled over Bachurim, if he fastened on the road to become uh, a heavy yoke, Yumiyao says in 15c, and I know this because this is third person, so it's him speaking, Gat Darach Adonai Niftulat Bat Yehuda. Literally, it's an image that we have to unpack, literally. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has been like Zorech Bagat, right? Gat is where they squeeze grapes. They squeeze grapes by treading on them. They trod or tread on the grapes, and the grapes, you know, break open. And out comes the grape juice. That's what you do in a gat. Well, what exactly is Yirmiyahu saying when he says that a Kodesh Baruch Hu, in an image, gat darach Adonai, leave to that bat Yehuda? What does that mean? And I think that the answer is, this is an extremely graphic image, is that Yirmiyahu is accusing the Rebona Shalom of virgin rape. That the, the breaking open of the grapes and the grape juice comes squirting out. This is what would happen in a virgin rape. And that's what it says. This is more graphic than anything that she had said. And by doing this, she, Bat Sion, hears Yirmiyahu, what up you know what she said? And so she feels encouraged. Because she knows what Yirmiyahu stands for. She knows whose side he's on. And if he can be sympathetic and vocalized, her pain may be even more graphically than she can. That will encourage her to voice more, to maybe move on. 16a, back to Batsion. Al ele ani bochia, eni eni yordamayim. And what is it that she is crying about? 16b, key phrase. Kirachak mimeni menachem meshiv nafshi. Now, those of you who are sensitive to the Hebrew know that this can mean one of two slightly different things. I have no comforter. Rachat mimeni menachem. There is no menachem for me. But I like the way that the English here is translated, and I think that this works. She is saying, not that I have no comforter, but the comforter is not around. But the hea That is to say, what am I really crying about? That my man is missing. That I don't have my connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's what she's crying about. Ki rachak mimeni. He is distant from me. Menachem meshiv nafshi. Notice what's happened here. Until now, everything that Bat Sion has complained about, the complaint is it's a sympathetic, sympathetic enough word, everything that she has expressed pain about has been her own physical pain. The pain of her daughters, her sons, her people, her city, physical pain. And what she says now, and this is a step up, is what I'm really pained about, what I'm really crying about, is that I feel a loss of connection with the Kodesh Baruch. That's a much higher level. You know, we're not far from Kodesh Elul. So we can go into Elul and Yom Yom and we can think about, oh, well, we want to have Sachar, not Onesh. We want to be granted Bracha and not Klala. We want to have good things and not bad things, and that's all true. But there's an entirely additional, higher level that what we really want in Elo and the Yom and the Rai is we want a Kesher with the Yubar Shalom. All that other stuff will flow from that. But to feel his closeness, to know that we are in connection with him. She has graduated now to a higher level because what she is pining about is the loss of sense of closeness with the Yubar Shalom. And hence, this is the fifth step. What we have here 
in 16a. Al ani bochia, eni eni yorda ma'im. Ki rachak mimeni menachem mishiv nafshi. Hayu vanai shomimim ki gavar oyev. Yud zan. You can see we're back now to hear me out. We're in black letters. We're in third person. Watch how Yermiyahu encourages Bat Sion forward. Persat Sion biyadeha. Ein menachem la. Sion spreads her hands out. What this means is that Yermiyahu is describing Bat Sion in the previous passage. I actually believe, friends, that once upon a time, this parak was acted out. I've done this, actually, with students. To have one person on a stage, Yirmiyahu, and another person on the stage, Batsio. Because when Yirmiyahu says here in 17a, Persad Sion Biadeha, what he is saying is that in the previous puzzle, we need to understand that we are visualizing Batsion saying the following. Al Ele Ani Bochia, Eni Ani Yodamai, Kiracha Primeni Menachem Meshiv Nafshi. Where is he? That's what Yermiyahu is describing in 17a. Persad Sion Biadeha. Ein Menachem. What a miskina. Kashbaru is not here. She's pining for it. Not just to relieve difficulties, physical difficulties. She wants the Kesher. She wants the connection. He ain't there. In fact, what Yermiyahu is going to tell her is that it's far worse than she thinks. She thinks, Rachak Mimeni. He's just distant. And Yermiyahu says, Oh no. Ein Menachem la 17b. Siva Hashem Yaakov. Sirivav Tzarav. Everything that's actually happening is because he has orchestrated it. He's actually quite close, and he's orchestrating all of this chaos, all of this difficult. But she can hear, but Sion can hear that Yermiyahu is understanding the play. Haitai Yushalayi Venida Venehem. Sixth stage. Pasuk Yudchet. Tzadik hu Adonai kifi hu mariti. What have we added here? Now, now, there's Tzidu Kadin. She recognized that there were Pshaim before. She used that word. When you say Pshaim, and you're admitting that you're at fault. But when she says, Tzadik Hashem Kifi Umariti, now there's no longer that long laundry list of Jacques, of this is overboard, or this is God flipping out. No. Now I understand that it's all proportional to what I deserve. This is a much higher level. This is level six. Tzadik Hashem Kifi Umariti. Page three. 18b. Shimona kola amim ure umach ovi utulotai uvachurai halkuba shevi. Why is she turning here to the other amim? I want to make a deal in the language that we have here. Earlier in uh, Pasuk, in Pasuk, uh, 12b, in 12b, she had turned also to the Ami. And she said there, Habi to Ure'u. She asked them to observe by watching, by seeing. But here, now, where we're up to in 18b, Shimuna kol ha'ami, Ure'u. This call to the other nations to listen. What's to listen? To see misery, what are they supposed to listen to? And I think what's happening here is a phrase that we have in many places. She is asking them to bear witness. Like, Hazino Asheva Dabera, Batishma Aretz in Refi, or Shimi, Shimu Shamaim Baaretz at the beginning of Yishayahu, where, where people call on various elements, agents, individuals to attest, to give testimony. And this is what she is doing. Kodesh Baruch was left, Kodesh Baruch was orchestrated this, 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 this mass punishment, which she has now accepted, and she's calling on the nations to, to be aided to what's happening here. Shimuna kola mihu ru'u machodim, mitulotai u bachorai al-chubashevi. Pasuk yutet, 
Karati li hey marimuni. Now she's getting it, right? This is her speaking. I called to my lovers and they betrayed me. Yes, that is what that is what Yirmiyahu himself had said in uh, 2C. 2B and 2C. Ema menachem mikol oveah. Kore'ea bagduba hayula l'oivim. She is now with her relatively high level of spiritual maturity. She is now able to connect the dots in a new way, in the way in which she needs to. She can now see that the other nations, the other powers, the other men that she turned to were not the right ones. Is that step seven? Did we get to seven yet? We're not up to seven. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We have six tzukim left. Okay. Maybe it was eight or nine. Okay. Karat 19. Karati the Mavai, Hema Rimuni, Koanaius Kenai, the Irgavau, Kidikshu Ochel Lamo, the Ashiduat Nasha. 20. Next stage. There are eight stages. This is the next stage. Re'e Hashem Kitsarli. May I Homar Maru. Ne Pachli be the Kirbi Kimaro Mariti. Notice, for the third time now, in the Perak, Batsion turns to Hashem and says, Re'e Hashem. But what is, what is different? The first two times when she turned to Hashem, she wanted Hashem to notice her abject state, her suffering. In Tet, Re'e Hashem et on yi, notice my suffering. In Yud Aleph, Re'e Hashem rabita ke'et izolela, I've become so lowly that I pounce on breadcrumbs to eat them. Now what does she want Hashem to notice? I'm going to read 20 again. Re'e Hashem kitsarli. But what am I tsar about? What am I pained about? She says, May I Maru, my innards are turning over. I have turned a new heart. I want a new page. I want a new start. Let me back in. Abba, where are you? I want to start fresh. This is what she wants to touch to know. This is a much higher level. Mariti, I understand what I did. I understand that I disobeyed. I understand that I broke the relationship. That is what troubles her. Twenty-one. They presumably the Amin. The nations heard Kinenacha. Ani ein menachem li. Kol oivai shamu raati. Sasu ki ata asita. They're having a field day. All those goyim that have seen my misery, that have seen that I have no one to comfort me. They're having a field day. The end of Chafal, 21c. Heveta yom karata viu kamoni. I want you, Kodesh Baruch Hu, to, to, to declare a field day on them. Pretty much what she's saying. The Yukamoni, I'm miserable, I want them to be miserable. This is we're coming to the final stage. Revenge. She wants revenge. 22. I want you to take an accounting of all the afflictions that they visited upon me. The Olel Lamo, do to them. Tit for tat, one for one. Every bit of suffering. Because I am miserable. Now, notice, she doesn't abdicate responsibility in Pasuk Hafei. She says, Kasher olalta li al kol pshaai. She accepts that this is ultimately because of Avir. But we need to understand, friends, and with this we close. We might have thought that the highest level of her spiritual maturation was when she did Sidu Kadim in Pasuk Yudchet. At the beginning of Yudchet, on the previous page, when she said, Sadiq hu Hashem ki fiu what, 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 what higher level could they be? That seems to be it. But according to the way in which this parent is structured, the highest level is when she calls for revenge. For revenge, depending on your politics, it's not always so cool. You know, 
in this country when people go, you know, ma, veda, ava, vi, ma, veda. Maybe some people like that. Some people are uncomfortable with that. Maybe many of us, especially in our age, are kind of uncomfortable with the idea of revenge for revenge's sake. We certainly don't, many of us, don't think of revenge as the highest mile of spiritual strivings. But that's what comes out here. Why is that? I think we can say the following. Implicit, inherent, when Batzion turns to the Rabbanu and says, I want you to visit upon them nekama, revenge, that has within it several very important elements. It shows that Batzion believes that Kodesh Baruch Hu actually cares about her, when in reality, that's not at all evident on the ground. Because on the ground, what people see is that God doesn't care about her. So this is a spiritual height to come to that feeling, even though what I see around me is that a Kaddish Baruch Hu doesn't give two hoots about me or hates me, that I recognize that it can be a different situation, that he might intercede on my behalf. Secondly, maybe even more importantly, is not only do I express the hope, the belief, that a Kaddish Baruch Hu might care about me, but that he's actually strong enough to do something about it. That he will be able to do to them what they did to me. Because when you look at your Shalani after the Korban, to believe that a Kodesh Baruch Hu is actually strong, to believe that a Kodesh Baruch Hu can do these things is not so simple. And so maybe in our time, we're a little bit uncomfortable with revenge. But for Jews living right after the Korban, if Yirmiyahu can bring them to believe that a Kodesh Baruch Hu cares enough about them to act on their behalf, if he can bring them to believe that a Kaddish Baruch Hu is capable of acting on their behalf, that he orchestrates everything, that is a very high amira. That's why this parak ends on this level. And that's how what we have here is a way in which Yirmiyahu Anavi writing the first parak of Megillat Echa is appealing to the down and out residents of Yerushalayim following the Chorban, who have a ton of theological questions. Who are despair, but I'm going to have nothing to do with anything having to do with Torah, Greek, Elohim, all that stuff, out, has orchestrated a dialogue in which he shows that he cares deeply about Am Yisrael, understands her pain deeper than she does, and shows the different steps that might be involved, six or seven or eight steps in her spiritual maturation, starting from just knowing that he's there to be called out to, moving through all these steps. The full spiritual maturation. And that's what we have here. In the of the May it be that we can find our place on this scale within a vastly different time. But I think this idea of spiritual progression, one step to the next, is something that's applicable for all of us in many years.